Good morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas. I hope you are having a wonderful morning and starting off your Christmas day, whether with family, with friends, or even at your own house. I want to thank you for joining us this morning for a special Christmas online experience, and I hope God is meeting you right there in your home. My name is Jared Michael, and I have the honor of pastoring City Beat Church, which is a wonderful church right here in Baltimore, Maryland. And this morning, what I wanted to do is instead of us gathering in a building, I know many people in our church are traveling and are out of state and enjoying time with family and friends. I wanted to create an experience where you could join us this Christmas day in your own home or in your aunt's home or in your grandfather or grandparents home, wherever you're at, and you could simply enter into the presence of God right where you're at. See, that's what makes Christmas so beautiful, is that it's no longer about a building, it's about we are carrying the living God within us. And so whether you're serving the Lord, or whether right now, if you're honest with yourself, you would say, Pastor, I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. I wanna thank you for joining us, and over the next couple minutes, I wanna help break down the Christmas story in a way that I believe God can make it real in your own heart. So will you pray with me this morning, and then we're going to read and finish out um, a passage we've been studying over the past couple weeks as a church body. Lord, we love you this morning. Thank you for each family, each person, whether a child, teenager, aunt, uncle, grandparent, whoever they are this morning. God, I pray you would speak to us right there in our homes. God, before we get busy with our Christmas traditions and opening presents and, and doing all the things that come with Christmas, God, I pray this morning we would center our hearts and our minds around the greatest gift we can unwrap this morning, and that's the gift of a Savior, Jesus Christ. So God, make your word real this morning to us. And I thank you, Father, for what you're going to do over the next couple moments. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say, Amen and Amen. Well, hey. Real quick before we get started, would you let us know where you're joining us from this morning? Simply type it in the chat, whether from here in Baltimore or around the country. Um, I got relatives up in Maine and all around the place, and they may be joining. And so let us know where you're joining at this morning, what state, what city. And um, we'd love to see all of the different people represented this morning online with us. And so this morning for a special Christmas message, we've been on a series over the past couple weeks as a church body in the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet who spoke of a coming Messiah. He was hundreds of years before Jesus would would have been born, but he was speaking of a coming hope that his nation would have in Jesus. And so we're going to read the final portion of our scripture this morning. It's in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. So if you have your Bibles or you have your phone, or you can follow along with me as I read this portion of scripture together. This is what it says. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. What's Isaiah referring to? He's referring to Jesus, the birth of a child who would be the savior of the world. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never And how beautiful is that? He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor, David, for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's army will make this happen. So as we conclude our our series we've been on, and if it's your first time joining us, um, Isaiah is referring to Jesus coming and the birth of a Messiah who would save his people from their sins. And he's now giving us detailed of what the Messiah would be. Not so much who it would be, the, the, the what, like what he would bring with him. And that was so important because in this current culture, in, in Isaiah's culture, they were in captivity. They, they, were, they were a strange people in strange lands. And Isaiah's saying, hey, a time's coming when a Savior's going to be born. And it's, it's going to be beautiful because Isaiah starts to lay out who the Messiah would be in the sense of the names of who he would be. And you know, names are so important. Names matter. Think about it. Maybe growing up as a child, maybe someone called you a name that wasn't very nice. And that name stuck with you. And it maybe really hurt you. 
And maybe if you're honest with yourself, even to this day, you refer back to sometimes that name that was spoken over to you. Maybe you had parents that, that were loving and affirming and growing up, they affirmed you and they spoke names that, that backed what they thought of you. And, and those names meant something to you and that carried you and that allowed you to be the person that you are today. See, names really matter. And so Isaiah gives four distinct names that the Savior would carry this, these titles. And, and in the Old Testament, names were so important because people didn't just name their children randomly. They would name them purposefully about who they were or whether they were going to carry this name, and it would be the legacy in which they would grow into. And so when Isaiah talks about these different names that the Savior would carry, what I want to do this morning, just briefly, is walk through these four names. And I pray this morning these four names would really, really, really resonate in your heart this morning and that God would speak to you as we open up His Word and talk about the four names that Isaiah talks about. So I want to just reread really fast these four names that Isaiah took, talked about. He said this in verse number 6. And he said, He will be called, who's the He? That's Jesus. Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. I want to walk through these four names this morning. Number one, Wonderful Counselor. The Savior, Jesus, who would be born, would carry the title Wonderful Counselor. When Isaiah refers to Wonderful Counselor, it indicates the kind of character the coming King would have. He would be a Wonderful counselor. I thought about when I was growing up in high school, we had a guidance counselor. And as we were getting ready to graduate, we would meet with this guidance counselor quite frequently because he would start to make sure we were ready for graduation and we had all our credits and all our classes we needed. But also he was making sure we were prepared for what would come next. See, many times he would explain to me that people weren't prepared for what was next, and so they would just get to graduation and forget there's much more to life than graduating from high school. And so he would lay out a game plan and say, hey, have you thought about colleges? Have you looked into colleges? If not, here are some ones I think would be good. And he would walk through all of that with us, and he was helping us as, as a counselor guide us and direct us into the future. See, Jesus was going to carry this distinct title as a wonderful counselor. But in, in this passage, the word wonderful literally means incomprehensible. So literally, Jesus would be incomprehensible. Like, he would bring with him this title of incomprehensible. The Messiah would be full of wonder that people couldn't even comprehend it. How beautiful is that? That the coming Messiah, Jesus, would be a wonderful Counselor, incomprehensible. The things he would do, the way he would carry himself, he would just be magnificent to be around. Think about that kind of person. And that's what Jesus is. Jesus is wonderful in a way that is boggling to our mind. See, when we think about Jesus, we don't just think of a person. We know Jesus, he is God. And that image of Jesus being God, one, is wonderful because that means because he is God and he came to save us from our sins that we have a hope that will last beyond this world. And so Isaiah says he'll be wonderful, he'll be magnificent, incomprehensible. And he says he'll be a counselor. Jesus is a wise counselor. He's good at what he does. He did not need a testimony of, of human beings to testify about him. God himself would testify about him. And that's what Isaiah is, is, Isaiah is prophesying. He'll be wonderful counselor. He'll be magnificent and he'll bring counsel. He'll bring wisdom. In Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Think about that. In Christ is, is, is all the wisdom and knowledge that we need. How beautiful is that? Think about it. Right now, as people are discovering maybe things on earth or even in NASA discovering things around um, our universe. And they're like in wonder, this is incomprehensible. What we're seeing, what we're discovering, new planets, new stars, new galaxies. And God just sits back and says, yeah, I did that. I'm incomprehensible. But not only that, in him is hidden 
all the wisdom and knowledge. Think about that. That includes the knowledge of human nature. That includes the knowledge of all the things we see and are discovering. But it also carries this, and I want you to think about this. Jesus always knows what we are going through, and He always knows the right course of action needed to help us. So He's wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. He's able to direct and lead us into the very places we need to go. Think about that. Some of us try to be our own counselor. In a world we live in right now, people are confused and, and, and looking for direction. And so they might meet up with someone for counsel. And there's nothing wrong with getting people's advice or wisdom on a situation. But think about it. How come a lot of times Jesus is the last person we come to for counsel? He should be the first person we come to because in Him is all wisdom, all knowledge. Think about that. While we're discovering these amazing things around the world and in our planets and galaxies, God sits back and says, see, in me is all knowledge, all wisdom. We can be sure that when we talk to God, He's listening because God told us that if we would pray to Him and come to Him with our worries, that He would listen. So I want to ask you this morning, is Jesus your wonderful counselor? When you think of Jesus, does it just amaze you and excite you because of who He is? Is He your counselor? Does He lead and does He guide your decisions? Does He lead and guide your very life? See, Isaiah said the coming king would be a wonderful counselor. He would be magnificent, incomprehensible. But he would be a leader who would guide his people. In him is all the fullness of wisdom and knowledge needed. We can be certain that Jesus has our best interest at heart because he loves us. Think about that. The gift of Jesus, God, stepping out of heaven, out of majesty, coming to, to earth that is frail and, and has many faults, but He would step into these, the, the, this, this planet called earth that we could have a wonderful counselor because He cares and He loves about us, that He knew that we needed a guide. We needed someone to guide us and lead us because in our own strength and our own wisdom, we're going to fail and we're not going to be going on the right course. But when we turn to Jesus, watch this, He's a wonderful counselor. And His love is so wide and deep and wonderful that we cannot fully understand it. See, the love of God is so incomprehensible that it just blows our human mind. We can't even think about it. When you start reading what the Bible says about the love of God, that God would send His only Son here to this earth. Wow! He's a wonderful counselor. In Him is all wisdom and all direction needed for our life. Is he your wonderful counsel this morning? Number two, Isaiah refers to Jesus as mighty God. Now recently, I started a journey of, of losing weight and with that, I noticed I had a lot of extra energy. And so I decided to join a local gym and I started going to the gym and running, which if you knew me a year ago, I hated running. I, I despised it. I mean, I would walk, but when I thought about running, I just, you know, I did not want to have any part in running. So now to think a year later that I'm running is interesting. But what I noticed is as I'm running and I started adding in some different exercises and working out, I started noticing my body getting stronger. I could do things, pull-ups and, and, and push-ups, and I can do things I couldn't do before. And your body starts to get strength. And as I was thinking about this title, Mighty God, I think about this, that as I'm noticing my body getting stronger, my human strength, no matter how strong I will be able to get here on earth, will never compare to this title of Jesus being mighty God. You see, our human strength is frail. Think about the person who can lift the most weights or, or carry the heaviest thing known to man. That may be impressive in our eyes, but in God's eyes, He just probably sits there and looks at them and says, that's nothing because I'm mighty God. Think about that. So what does that mean, mighty God? To rely on the power of God, we must learn, watch this, to cease from trusting in our own frail efforts and hand our resources over to the one who can do anything. Wow, how beautiful is that? We are but frail human beings, and Jesus would be mighty God. See, His strength 
There, there's not a weakness in God's strength. See, in, in, our, in, our, um, in our human efforts, there's weakness. See, what, the strongest person, there's going to be a limit of, of eventually they can't lift that or carry that anymore. But in Jesus, mighty God, there is no faults or frailness about him. He is mighty God. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, 12, 9, it says, God's power is perfect in our weakness. So meaning God knew we were weak and we needed a mighty God as a savior. So God would send Jesus as mighty God. I was thinking about a few different stories in the Bible that kind of help us understand this a little better. One of them was the disciples were at their wits end trying to figure out during, while Jesus was here on earth about feeding 5,000 people. There was 5,000 men, not including women and children. And Jesus said to his disciples, feed them. And they said, Jesus, all we have is this little bread and this little fish. It won't even barely feed five people. And Jesus said, you feed them. They said, but how? And Jesus said, bring me what you have. So the frail disciples brought the, the frail food they had. And Jesus lifted it up to heaven and blessed the food and gave thanks to it. And all of a sudden, the mighty God came on the scene. And not only were all 5,000 men and all the women represented fed, but there was access, there was, there was extra left over. How beautiful that the mighty God not just provided for that moment, but there was leftovers. See, God was showing his disciples, see, you're frail. You need a mighty God. You need me. Joshua in the Old Testament stood helpless before the mighty walls of Jericho. That was the first um, opposing army they would take on when God sent them into the promised land. And Joshua stood up a mound uh, in front of this mighty city called Jericho. But he learned to trust the battle plan of God. And what happened? After, after seven days of marching around the walls, they screamed and they shouted. And the mighty God broke those walls down and they fell. And the Israelites went in and took the land of Jericho. See what the people of Israel were frail and faultless and, and not being able to do. God said, let my mighty power come and be at work. The last one I was thinking about is Zer Zerubbabel. He faced the daunting task of rebuilding the temple of God in the Old Testament. And God reminded him that the work that would be done of rebuilding the temple that was broken and in, 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 in despair and in rubble, God reminded Zerubbabel, see, Zerubbabel, it's not going to be by your power nor by your might, but it's only going to be by my spirit, meaning my spirit, my power is going to be at work and it's going to help you complete the task I've called you to. And one thing I know about understanding the power of God is that only really can we fully comprehend it is when we pray. Prayer is a vital part of relying on the power of God. See, as we pray, we start to understand God and His work in our life. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Matthew 7, 7 through 8. So Jesus was saying, look, I know what you need. I'm a mighty God. So instead of you trying to figure it out and trying to make it work, instead of you trying with your faultless and frail efforts to try to come up with a solution, come to me. I'm mighty God. Knock, seek, and ask. And I know what you need. And I'm able to provide. I'm able to be there for you because I know the weaknesses you have. So come to mighty God and I'll show myself strong on your behalf. No matter how weak or ill-equipped we may feel at times, we can rely on the power of God. The Bible says we have this assurance that God is able to do immeasurably. Think about that. Immeasurably. We can't even measure what God can do in our lives. And what are we able to do? We can't even measure it or comprehend it according to the power, the Bible says, that's at work within us. So that's the kind of God we serve. He's a mighty God. We have confidence that ultimately God will accomplish his good in our lives when we turn to Him and trust Him and live our lives in a way that's pleasing to Him. And all things, God works for the good of those who love Him and who have been called according to His purpose. Romans 8, 28. How beautiful is that? God knows what we need and He says, come to me, rely on me, and my strength will be perfect. Even when you're weak, my mighty power, my mighty strength will be there for you. I know what you need. 
The third title Isaiah said that Jesus would carry is Everlasting Father. See, in ancient times, there was a, um, a considered thing or, or theme of a father of a country. And this was very well known that there would be father of a country. Many Americans in, in the country I live would think of, when I think of father of a country, maybe think of George Washington. He's called the father of our country. It was Washington's determination and leadership that led to victory in the Revolutionary War and his support of a strong national government that led to at least part of ratifying the U.S. Constitution that we still use and it's in effect today. Without Washington, the United States might not exist today or it might exist with a far different form of government. So think about it. The father of a nation is able to, to, to establish something in ancient times, the father of a nation was viewed in much the same way as the father of a family. The father, it was the father who was to protect and provide for the children. In the same way, this child to be born, who's the, who's the child to be born? Jesus, Isaiah was referring to, would become a king who will be a father to his children. So think about how beautiful that is. That out of all the titles you would carry, one of them would be everlasting father. You know, we live, in, we live in a day and age where many, many people have father wounds or are carrying hurt from a father. And God's promise was that his son, his savior that he was sending, he would be an everlasting father. He would be able to guide and lead us and direct us in good things. He will protect and provide for us. Think about this. Jesus's role as protector and provider, is not limited to age or even death. His role as father is everlasting. How beautiful is this? It's an everlasting father, meaning our earthly fathers one day will pass away. We all have a, a born date and we all have a death date. But Jesus would be everlasting father. That even maybe we lose our physical father here on earth. He says, my promise is I'm going to be everlasting father. How beautiful. How beautiful. And I want to encourage you this morning. Is Jesus your everlasting Father? Well, Pastor, what does that mean? That means as a father guides and protects his children, are you letting Jesus guide and protect you in your life? See, a father takes care of his children. He watches out for them. Is your life truly in God's care? Is he your father? See, growing up, I had, a, I had great parents and, and I knew I could lean on my dad. When I was in trouble, when I needed something, when I, when I was in confusion, I could lean on my father for direction and he could help me. See, that's what Jesus would do for his children. He would help direct, guide, and lead them but as a father would do. See, a father brings a tenderness, a love to him, that he helps his children. He cares for them. He has, his, that he has their best interest at heart. Think about that. A loving father knows what his kids need. See, God knows what you need. He knows what you're longing for. He knows the deep down things of your heart that maybe even no one else knows about, but you struggle with at night because you carry a longing, a burden, something inside of you. And a father today wants to meet you where you're at. Maybe you're always anxious or overwhelmed or maybe you're just confused and you're looking for guidance and, and all of these things. And the everlasting Father reaches down this morning right into your home and says, will you grab my hand? Take it. I know what you need. Let me be the Father that you need. And I'm not a Father that's going to disappoint you. I'm not a Father that's going to help you then leave you. I'm an everlasting Father. Meaning I'm here and when you invite me into your heart, I'm here to stay. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you, the Bible says. How beautiful is that promise? He'll never leave us. He'll never, even in the worst moments of our life, He will help us. He's an everlasting Father. And the last name Isaiah gives is Prince of Peace. In a world filled with war and violence, it's difficult to see how Jesus could be all-powerful God who acts in human history and embodies peace. How, how, how could this come about, you know? Even right now in the current state of our world, wars and rumors of wars and all of these things and chaos and strife and, and hatred and all of this stuff, how can there be a prince of peace in the middle of all this? But it's interesting because the way I want to try to help you understand this title 
of Jesus being Prince of Peace, it wasn't so much about physical safety, and it wasn't even so much about political harmony. That doesn't necessarily reflect this title. The kind of peace that he was talking about was much deeper. It wasn't so much of an external peace, sorry, an external peace. It was more internal. See, that's where peace starts. Peace doesn't start by the surroundings around us. Peace starts first in here. See, if you don't have peace in here, it can be peaceful all around. But inside, there's a war, a struggle, strife. But when there's peace in here, no matter what outside or the out, what the news or the circumstances are saying, there's a peace that comes from within. See, the Bible says in our sinful state, we are all enemies with God, Romans 5.10 says. But watch this. But God demonstrated His own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. So we were all enemies and hostile to God. But even in our sinful state, God had a plan to send a Prince of Peace to this earth to die on our behalf. That would be Jesus, His only Son. And He would die a sinner's death, but not stay dead, but rise again. Why? Because of Christ's sacrifice, we are restored to a relationship of peace with God. Think about that. That when you come into a relationship with God, you're now not hostile anymore to God. You're, you're at peace with God. See, one of the things I notice as a pastor is when I talk with people, after some time, I can tell if they really have peace with God. See, questions I ask and certain things I'll say, I can tell if there's an internal struggle and a war going on or if there's truly peace with God. Think about that. You can have such a peace with God that it's internal that no matter what the outside is saying, no matter what the outside is, 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 is happening or doing, internally there's a peace. Someone say peace this morning. There is a peace. This is the deep abiding peace between our hearts and our Creator that cannot be taken away. And the ultimate fulfillment of Christ's work as Prince of Peace, isn't that the outside would be peaceful and calm. It's that the inside of us would have peace. Christ's sacrifice provided more than external peace. It allows us to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, the Helper who promises to guide us. So when we turn to Jesus, now we have the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, that comes and dwells within us, and it brings with, with Him the peace of God, how beautiful is that? That when we give our lives over to, to Jesus, we have the peace of God. And watch this further. The Holy Spirit will manifest Himself in us by having, helping. So when the Holy Spirit comes and lives on us, He helps us live a life that we can't live on our own. He helps us live to please God. He helps us live a life of love, of joy, of peace. All of these things in our own strength we will lack. But when the Spirit of God comes in, we first get peace with God. And then out of that flows all of these things that we don't have in our own strength. A, a, a deep love, a deep joy, a deep peace. Think about that. This love, joy, and peace are all results of the Holy Spirit working in the life of a believer. That's why so many people can look at Christians, and they should be able to look at Christians. Even in a world that's full of wars and chaos and confusion and say, why is there such peace within that person? Because peace isn't external, it's internal. That's the peace that Jesus came to bring. It was an internal peace. And I want to clarify this morning that Him bringing this peace doesn't mean it would always be easy. Jesus never promised easy. He only promised help. In fact, He told us to expect tribulations and trial, but He said, I'll be with you. So that Holy Spirit that comes and lives within us, it brings a peace even when the outside is in turmoil. And even though we may experience death and hardship and trials and tribulation, there can be a peace that God is with us and He is the Prince of Peace and He's in us and we have peace in the midst of the storm. I love this in Philippians 4. It's, Jesus said, He also said that if we call on Him, He would give us the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension. So even when our minds can't comprehend why we have peace, we can know it's from the Prince of Peace. Amen? Jesus would carry the title Prince of Peace. No matter what hardships you're facing, no matter what you're going through, 
you can ask the Prince of Peace this morning, who's all powerful. He's a loving God and he's not dependent on your strength. He comes in with his strength, with his peace as a father would. And he gives counsel to you that he would guide and lead you in the path he called you for. God knows what you need. He knows who you are. And he's able to help you this morning. And so I pray this morning as we were walking through these titles, talking about Jesus carrying these titles, I hope maybe one of these titles resonated in your heart this morning. And maybe you're a Christian, but you're really weary. I pray this morning, maybe you need him to, you need Jesus to be wonderful counselor to you. Maybe mighty God, maybe your everlasting father, maybe prince of peace. Whatever it is this morning, it's all available to you. It's simply up to you to receive what it is you need. Maybe this morning you're not a Christian. And if you're honest with yourself, you say, Pastor, I'm only watching this because my family said to watch it with them. But you don't have peace with God. There's internal strife and conflict. And there's actually, even if, if we could look internally, there's like a war going on inside of you. But this morning you can have a peace with God that no matter what happens in your life, no matter what's going on outside of circumstances that are out of your control, there's a peace of God within you. I remember when I was 18 years old, I was in the final days before my mom would pass away. And you know, that was a devastating time in my life. But in that moment, I understood and I began to learn the peace of God like I never knew before. You see, alternately, everything should have said, be depressed, be anxious, be overwhelmed be fearful. I mean, all of these things that the world would have said, yeah, that, that's normal. You should feel that way. But internally, I, if I was honest, I would say I didn't feel that way. There was, there was a peace that transcended my understanding. And now when I look back, I know it was literally from God, that God knew exactly what I was going through. And he knew the, out, the outside, what was happening all around me. But the Holy Spirit came and brought with him the Prince of Peace. And he was a comforter. He helped me. He guided and he led me. And now I'm here today at 32 years of age preaching right now to you on Christmas Day. Not because of my strength. Not because I'm a good counselor. I'm strong and, and I have everything. No, it's because his strength and his power at work within me has sustained me, has kept me, and will future lead me. Amen? And that's what he can do for you too. You don't have to rely on your strength. You don't have to rely on your wisdom. Why are you going to keep trying doing it yourself? Come to Jesus this morning. Humble yourself and let the power of God show himself real in your life. So I want to pray for you this morning. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want to invite you into a relationship. What, greatest pre what greater present can you open today than the one of peace with God? And that's an internal present. That's not something you're going to actually open under a tree. It's something you're going to open in your heart. So will you pray with me this morning? If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want to invite you into a relationship. It's not just by praying. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll have peace with God. So let's pray this morning. Dear Jesus, I thank you for, God, each person watching this online this morning. God, I believe you brought them here, not by accident, not just because a family member asked to watch it with them. God, I believe there was a divine appointment this morning for them to watch this. And God, I pray right now, if someone within the sound of my voice does not know you as Lord and Savior, right now, Father, they would confess you as Lord and Savior. They would repent of their sins. They would turn from the way in which they're living now and turn to Jesus and open their heart to receive the free gift of God. And that free gift of God's available to anyone. And God, I pray this morning on Christmas Day that God, we would see you at work as these four things, as wonderful counselor, as mighty God, as everlasting Father, and as Prince of Peace. And God, this Christmas would be the greatest one yet, not because of the amount of presents we got or the amount of family we were surrounded by, but because you made yourself real to us this Christmas morning in a new and a fresh way. I thank you for everyone watching, Lord. I pray you be with them. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now listen, 
If you said a prayer with me this morning and, and, and maybe it was internal, maybe you don't want to say it out loud, that's okay. What matters is that you truly open your heart to Jesus, that you repented of your sins, and you said, I'm not going to do it on my own. I'm turning to Jesus as my Savior. That's what Christmas was all about. We needed a Savior, so God sent His one and only Son. So if you said that prayer, I want to invite you to go to citybeatchurch.org. And up at the top, you'll see a link that says online. Click that, and you'll see a link down below if you scroll a little bit that says, I said yes to Jesus. I want you to click on that. And there'll be some stuff to fill out. We want to be in touch with you and help you on the next steps of being a believer. It's so important that you walk together. You're a part of a bigger family than yourself. There's a family of God that wants to come around you. And if you don't have a church you call home, you can join us right here at City B Church. We'd love to have you. Our next service will be January 1st, New Year's Day. We'll be back in this place and we're going to be celebrating all that God's going to do in the new year. And we would love for you to join us. And if you're joining us and you're a part of our church already, I want to wish you a happy and Merry Christmas. I hope today was one where you realized the point of Christmas in a fresh way, but also you would allow the Savior of the world to be your mighty God, your wonderful Counselor, your everlasting Father, and your Prince of Peace. I love you. Thank you for joining us. I hope you have a blessed Christmas. And I pray that God would be with you on this Christmas. God bless you.